Welcome to Agile to Agility Podcast with Milan Bayic. Major show alert! The very first value we wrote is individuals and interactions. Let's take this to another level. All right, let's get started. It's 1.15 Eastern. Um, thank you very much for those of you that joined. I know uh, you probably have other things and other priorities, but you decided to be here. So thank you. Um, for this session, we have Jeff Watts, Stephanie Ockerman, Ockerman and Ryan Ripley um, to just talk about uh, some of the questions that you might have for them, some of the questions that I might have for them. And uh, um I don't know, maybe Stephanie, we can start with you, Ryan, and then Jeff. Uh, just maybe quickly introduce yourself, maybe just quick 30 second intros if you want. Uh, you can also pass, it's totally up to you. <laughs> just uh, tell us yeah. maybe about yourself, maybe currently what you're working on or anything, uh, and uh, we'll dive into after that. Yeah, all right. Uh, so my name is Stephanie Ackerman, and um, I am the co-founder, trainer, chief writer, all the things um, at AgileSocks.com. Um, so many of you might know me from the articles, blogs, videos that I put out into the world, as well as the book Mastering Professional Scrum. Um, but I really focus on um, training and coaching for agility and enablement. So uh, professional scrum trainer. Um, so I kind of really hone in on the, the leveraging professional scrum. And then one of the things that I've been more passionate about over the past few years is really helping scrum masters go into those deeper levels of skills and leadership um, that's at, that are actually needed to kind of actually leverage scrum and um, take that service leadership approach uh, more effectively. Great. Sorry, I just clicked on that. Um, Ryan, I think I said you go next. and then Sure. Yeah. So uh, thanks for having me. This is uh, it's really neat to get to be on a panel with Stephanie and Jeff, probably two of my favorite Agilists aside from Todd. Um, so <laughs> my name is Ryan Ripley. I'm a, a co-founder of Agile for Humans with uh, Todd Miller. Uh, we also collectively wrote Fixing Your Scrum Practical Solutions to Common Scrum Problems. Probably most people on here know us from the YouTube channel. So we have we've developed a pretty large offering on YouTube with a bunch of playlists on the framework on evidence based management. We do a daily show called Your Daily Scrum. And so every day we post a video answering scrum questions. And so this particular panel should be pretty comfortable. If not, I'm in trouble. <laughs> um, but uh, also a professional scrum trainer like Stephanie with scrum.org. And so we both teach a lot of the courses. Uh, that are in the catalog with scrum.org. And we are both committed to Ken's vision and mission and uh, try to put good work into the world. She's amazing on the coaching side. And my focus is more on the um, management leadership uh, side. Unfortunately, Todd, my business partner and fellow professional scrum trainer is more on the product owner side. And so between a lot of us, we cover a lot of bases and um, just try to put a lot of good work into the world and work with great people like Stephanie and Jeff and others. And um just try to have a little fun along the way too great thank you ryan and jeff yeah jeff watts based in the uk um i'm not a professional scrum trainer um i've written a few things uh, i've spoken about a few things um and i've worked at a few places all trying to help people as i finally managed to succeed in explaining to my kids what my job was i help people get better at what they do whatever that is um, so yeah, I don't, <clears throat> I don't really have a better explanation of who I am than that. Um, mostly in the agile space, but not always. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. So let's dive into it. We have uh, just a little less than an hour, fifty-five minutes. So uh, let's dive into. So it's going to be a mixture between my questions and questions that people have posted. Um, uh, you, uh ryan and stephanie were talking about their reviews and uh earlier so i thought you know maybe i mentioned to them we can start with this one so uh, it's a pretty common one 
uh, where people or teams say our reviews are not effective. We don't know, we don't get a lot of feedback. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Maybe we can start with Stephanie. But yeah, the- so, yeah, I think there, there's a lot of different ways this challenge can manifest. And the one kind of I'm looking visually on the screen around, you know, we're talking to our stakeholders regularly in very short updates, you know, we show them stuff as we build it, maybe we're even doing continuous delivery. That's kind of the, the scenario I'm painting with this, this question. So, you know, like, why, why we don't get a lot in the sprint review, because we're already in touch with them. Well, um, in that type of scenario, my initial thoughts are that, like, you know, our purpose here, we are inspecting the increment, right? Recognizing some of your stakeholders may have seen parts of that increment, but maybe not all of them have seen the big picture. So there is some opportunity here for some bigger picture level setting and, you know, inspecting the increment and our progress toward the product goal. So this is a little bit of an opportunity um, to kind of come, like kind of come up a little bit too and look at that bigger picture. Um, And so how we form questions, how we Um, ask for feedback really matters. And so versus just showing people something and saying what feedback you have, like we want to be intentional around what do we need? And every scrum team is going to be a little bit different based on how they already engage, what their product is, their different types of stakeholders, right? So I encourage people to kind of maybe break out of, oh, I've seen it done this way before, or I read a blog post that said, here's a good facilitation technique you're still gonna have to figure out what works best in your context and what needs you have, right? So so in this scenario, maybe thinking of the bigger picture and then how do I get the information we need to make decisions about what's coming next? Yeah, I think Stephanie's focus on the increment and then the actions to take, it's really good, right? I I think delivery and then focused on the, the end uh, increment to, or the one of the increments there could be many in a sprint is really smart. I just have a lot of questions based off of this question, right? So are they uh, are they regularly in exchanges because we're constantly stuck in status update meetings, right? And are we is our calendar full of we're we're going to talk to these two stakeholders and those two stakeholders? Mike, I think a big question here would be if you were to sit all the stakeholders to, down together would they give a consistent, coherent um, narrative about how the product's going and the feedback and, and the, the value being delivered? And an assumption I would make here is the answer would be no. And so I, I think part of this could be um, a lot of extra meetings happening. It could be uh, there's a disconnect between stakeholders, but I also wonder if the stakeholders understand the purpose of the sprint review. They're supposed to be coming back with not just their own opinions, but market opinions and budget updates. And there's so many more things that could be happening here that um, I just wonder if there's just kind of misunderstandings here, if there's disconnections here, and just a lot of extra meetings taking place that don't need to. So on top of Stephanie's great response of focus on the increment, focus on delivery, um, I think there's some really good questions to ask here as well. Also, I mean, like, do you have the right people? A lot of times yeah. the right people are not you know, there. So uh, Jeff, what are, you, what are your thoughts on this? So I'm, I'm tempted to answer around the question <laughs> because there's, there's lots of different things. It could be around safety. It could be around is the feedback. Are we actually any good at giving good feedback and so on? But that's not, that's not the context of this question. So I think the main context of the question has been covered. The one aspect that I think I'd probably pull out is you have the opportunity here. Uh, if you're not going to, well, first of all, it says thinking about maybe we'll cancel the 15 minutes. I think you'd probably keep that if that's working. If that's making the review ineffective, you keep that and, and lose the review. And you know, we don't have to stick to everything. But before you do, think about how you might be able to use that differently. So maybe those stakeholders don't need to come to the review that have been speaking to you every day, but other stakeholders do. Um, maybe those stakeholders come, but instead of looking backwards, you use the sprint review to look forwards, which I know sounds paradoxical given the word review, but you know, a good part of that is thinking, well, where's this product going next? Um, so you could reuse the review for a different purpose or with different stakeholders. Okay, I don't know if uh, Yagmur, uh, if you're here or if you have any follow-up question or somebody else has a, a follow-up question um, on this topic that would like to 
Or if I you want to share thinking. your thoughts, uh, I'll open it up to others if they want to chime in briefly. Keep it short. Sure. This is Adira. Hi. I just thought maybe if you don't have a lot of participation to do a mini retro at the end of the review. But um, I like to kind of let my team know what the expectation is during, let's say, a retro. So I kind of read the scoring system um, at the beginning. So I like Chris Stone. I don't know if anybody knows him, but I like his questions about um, rating the review because it puts the onus on the participants to really drive the, um, the direction and the efficacy of the meeting. If nobody's participating, that isn't the person's fault necessarily who's facilitating it. It's dependent on wide participation. So I think maybe it might help to change the expectation of what the meeting is for and what you wanna see out of it, perhaps. Yeah. Hi, this is Cameron. Just uh, an interesting question. I think we have using the word stakeholders. It would be important to really, you know, kind of think through, uh, are these the right stakeholders or why, uh, or really do a proper analysis of the stakeholders? Why would some, somebody not provide, um, is it because the, the feedback is not there or is it because people do not really as much care? So again, it will go back to, are we really building the valuable thing for the customers? And is it really valuable for the organization? Yep. Yeah, yep. and All just to add in here, like what I'm picking up on from a number of people, and I think Jeff mentioned this as well, it's like, let's talk to our product owner. Like, how are we, how are we getting input from stakeholders? How are we managing their expectations? Are we establishing relationships with them? Because if the only time a product owner ever talks to ever the majority of stakeholders is at a sprint review, then maybe the point of maybe they don't feel comfortable or maybe there isn't a level of trust yet to give feedback, right? Like, so, you know, I think an underlying theme of a lot of what we're talking about is like, we need to kind of partner with our product owners and start to dig in because there could be a lot of different things at play here. So I just want to kind of emphasize, like, involve your product owners in, in helping understand what's really happening and what's really needed here. Also, a lot of times what I see is like teams don't have strong definition of done or like what they're actually sh showing is uh, very hard to provide feedback for stakeholders. So that could be another aspect to validate and check, you know, make sure that uh, you have the right people, but you're actually having stuff that people can react to. <laughs> You know, or or it could just be that this team might be using mob or ensemble programming, and perhaps they have found a way that they can deliver value quickly, and they're just mm -hmm. winning. Yeah. This could be a very positive uh, and probably still good implementation of Scrum, and and it, maybe this is just good. Hi, could this be, is yeah. uh, Jenny. I noticed the last sentence said, since two week sprints is too much, too long to wait for feedback. Would a one week sprint work? And then you just have a weekly sprint review. Would that be a compromise that where well, you, know, you reduce the meetings, but you're still getting the value? I just wondered why two weeks is too long to wait, isn't it? That's an interesting subject yeah. in its own right. Yeah, Jenny, I think that's a great call out. It's, um, I think there's a misconception that you have to wait until the review to talk to a stakeholder. Yeah. And, and that's just so wrong. Like, I, I love the fact that this team is talking regularly with stakeholders. I mean, that's mm -hmm. that's I, that's why I kind of came around on this one after listening to the some of these other comments where maybe this is just great. They have great stakeholder engagement. Maybe the developers are working with them directly. It looks like they are. Um, if I read into this question a little bit, maybe it's just good. And uh, but yeah, it, regardless of whether you follow this pattern or uh, professional scrum, um, the idea that you have to wait till the end to get stakeholder feedback is just wrong. Mm -hmm. You can still you can talk to stakeholders as often as necessary to make sure you're aligned and working towards your sprint goal correctly and that the increment's going to be awesome, right? That's that's encouraged. Uh, great. Um, so Jeff, uh, would you like to comment on this? I know Marco and Anna want to um, uh, ask questions. So we'll go Jeff, uh, Marco, Anna, and then we'll move on to the next question. Jeff, totally optional if you have anything Which, else to add or not. Anything else? So you're talking to me, Miriam? Yeah. So anything else to add to what's already been said? I think it's I think it's a pretty good summary. Okay. Um, Marco. 
Yeah, I think uh, Ryan actually mentioned quite a lot of good things just at the end there, before uh, after I'd raised my hand, which is about uh, Agile is about bringing us closer to customers and users. So with this regular meeting, if this is helping with the conversation of going towards the sprint goal, making sure that we're on track and that it actually is of value, the value that we're generating is actually valuable to our customers, then that's great. And I think what the, our, our, our experts actually mentioned, which is the product goal. If this is not what we're going to be inspecting necessarily during these collaboration meetings that we're doing during the actual two weeks. So this would be a good time for the review to look forward. So yeah, I totally agree with all that. Great. Uh, and, looks like and I draw, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, like, I think what we're all actually saying is like with this tiny bit of context, it could be like a thousand different things that are going on. So it's like I know it's the favorite answer. I'm joking that we give in a training class is well, it depends, <laughs> right? And so it's like these are like there's so many great divergent kind of like, hey, it could be this, it could be that, it could be that. And it's like you need to be like a scientist in your world, right? And like start uncovering, like start observing, looking for those signs, because there are likely more than one challenge going on here, right? And so it's like, where are we? Where do we want to go? And then running little experiments to see if your assumptions are correct. And if you're moving towards solving the actual underlying challenges that you're noticing. Um, so just kind of like a, that's that's the that's the vibe I'm getting from like all these great ideas and answers and including the things that people are posting in the chat, like lots of good stuff here. Be the scientist and start creating more transparency and running experiments. Mm -hmm. Great, Tim. I don't know. I just saw you raise your hand if you want to keep it short, but just uh, to give it yeah, a it just, it just real short here. And then and just going back to something what Ryan's saying, guys, remember one of, one of the key things, key tenants of, of Scrum and Agile is continual feedback. Continual feedback doesn't mean waiting for the meeting, it means continual feedback. It means as soon as I have something, I need to go either to my engineer, my PO, or my product manager. So yeah, let's just remember that, you know, the ceremonies are the beginning of the conversation, not the end of it. Uh, great, great point. All right, uh, let's move on to the next question, which is related to this one here. Uh, what are some of the tools Scrum Master can use? I would like to maybe open this up for, you know, what are some of the things the Scrum Master should have in their toolbox? So for instance, if you think about some of the essentials from your perspectives, when you're looking at, you know, maybe hiring or if you're helping people hire Scrum Masters, what, what would you consider the essential skills, tools, that uh, the Scrum Master should have in their toolbox? Yeah, it, this one's, um, it's it's an interesting question, right? So what skills should, it, you know, should they have? I mean, um, I always think about the stances. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, when the Scrum Master role or accountability um, is such a hard thing to to describe because we're expecting this person uh, to be an excellent facilitator, an excellent coach, a mentor, a trainer, a teacher, um, a manager in a sense, or, or maybe a process manager, right? We're expecting them to be excellent with Scrum, but now the, the game has shifted a little bit. Well, they need to have a solid grasp of Kanban, flow metrics, uh, lean thinking. And so we've turned this, this set of accountabilities, like we need all of these skills. And there are people in this world who work as facilitators full-time and who work as coaches full-time and who work as uh, trainers and teachers. And we've put all of these things together and said, oh, and by the way, you need to be a great communicator, a great collaborator. You need to speak well. You need to be humble. You can't make this about yourself. We need you to put other people first. Uh, we need you to have a servant uh, leadership mindset. We need you to have a caring heart for and a heart for others. We need you to also be aggressive and assertive when needed to remove impediments. We need you to understand what an impediment is. We need you to work on the organization. We need you to understand how to work with managers and leaders, but also you need to be able to talk to everyone from the janitor to the CEO perfectly. And so to to just you know, and and so it's no surprise that on LinkedIn and other sites, the job descriptions are ridiculous. Um, and that scrum masters are constantly trying to figure out their place in an organization. And so 
you know, what is the right list? We need a person who's willing to step into that insanely uncomfortable space, who thrives in complexity, who loves people, and who wants their teams to be wildly successful. And if we can get that, I believe that people like Jeff and Stephanie and myself can teach Scrum, we can teach flow metrics, we can teach Kanban, we can teach the, the, the skills, but we need that person. And so what I'm saying something un, un, unpopular here, not everyone can do this, right? And so, and it's really hard to explain what this is, <laughs> right? Maybe Stephanie and Jeff can clean it up for me, but it's a lot. Yeah. Well, and what this is reminding me of, Ryan, is actually one of the uh, fixing your coaching, I think, episodes we recorded. Yeah. Um, and so maybe we'll send that link to be sent out. But I and I and I also want to say, like, when I read Jeff's book, you know, I, I think read Jeff's book, right? Um, as well, it's like it's not so much about I know X number of agile practices and facilitation techniques, it, uh, you know, because it's about how you leverage, like making choices about what techniques and processes and tools to leverage when, and also recognizing that you don't have to have all the answers. So I, you know, when I'm looking for somebody like as a scrum master, it's around like, who they are as a person and how they like approach complexity and their comfort level in complexity and unpredictability and understanding of humans and team dynamics. Um, and like that, that openness and curiosity and like the person who doesn't need the roadmap of if this happens, then do X, but then if this happens, then do Y, right? Like it's not gonna, that's not, it's not going to work that way. Like we need somebody who's willing to walk into these uncomfortable, unpredictable, complex situations. And I do believe the personal leadership skill sets, those tools are really what ultimately become the most important and then allow you to grow in terms of what one might call your traditional toolkit, right? In terms of mm -hmm. learning about flow metrics, learning about um, facilitation techniques, learning about conflict management, learning about how to give feedback, right? Like those things all will eventually come up as a need, um, but it's about how you leverage them. And to me, that's much more in that personal leadership and like my ability to like be in complexity and unpredictability. Yeah, I mean, even though you're not both, uh, I guess, uh, you know, Ryan alluded to it, you're talking about it. You're, we're not, you're not saying like specific skills, but a lot of like, you know, under, having, you know, high level of self-awareness, like understanding where your blind spots are. Like, you know, you, you refer to it, maybe I call it like inner development, but there's still, th these are the things that you're still looking at. They're not just maybe more tangible, but those I would still consider it, you know, when I'm looking at somebody like, you know, how well, like some people run away from uncertainty. Some people understand that you can't really, you just got to deal with it. Right. Um, and those are things that, you know, maybe uh, are not as visible, but we still are kind of looking for those type of traits. And uh, Jeff, what about you? What are your thoughts on this topic? Um, if uh, my thoughts are that the answer is already are fantastic and if i'd have had 10 minutes i think i could come up with something very clever um but i haven't got 10 minutes so you've got to have something that's half stupid but i'm going to try so i could i could list all sorts of characteristics and traits and skills and tools um, but i'm going to limit myself to three <clears throat> And for a change, I'm not going to give you an acronym. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but I'm going to try and link it to the second half of the question on the screen in front of me, which is around sparking purpose and impact. Because I think if a Scrum Master can spark something in the people, in the team, in the organization, then more than half of their job is done. So if I can tap into that, I don't create purpose, purpose is there, but I can tap into it. I think back to some of the things that have helped me with that. One is around assertiveness. So it's very easy to just go along with the status quo, but actually we're there to challenge the status quo, not just in the organization, but equally the people we're, we're coaching, we're challenging their assumptions, we're challenging their limiting beliefs, we're challenging their views about what's possible for themselves and others. 
this. So assertiveness, making sure that things actually happen, that we can see results from our efforts and putting ourselves in this area of discomfort. The second thing I think that ties into purpose and impact is having belief. Now you could call this continuous positive regard or something else, but basically genuinely having a positive belief in the intentions and the capacity of people within the organization and the organization itself. It's very easy to look at something and think, oh, this is just another example of why things just aren't ever going to work around here. Or what was that person thinking? Or this policy, this process is such a pain in the backside. Whoever thought of this must be an idiot. But there is very few people in the world who actually design processes or make decisions deliberately to sabotage the organization, let alone you. So choosing to believe that people have good intentions, choosing to believe that people have the capacity to change, to do good things, I think is an essential part of doing that. And the third thing, which is probably the one thing I've had to learn the most over the years, is calm. So emotions are contagious. So if I start talking really, really fast, then people would start to feel a little bit more stressed. But if I speak calmly and slowly, people generally start falling asleep. And this is my intention. And you won't worry about what I'm saying. All right. So I can have an impact on those around me. And it's very easy, like I said, to think, to notice all the things that aren't working and things that aren't changing. But having patience while also being assertive, staying calm when things are going difficult or challenging. Uh, we're dealing with those tricky problems and we're dealing with conflict and we're dealing with everybody's biases and all these kinds of things but staying calm will radiate that calmness throughout the organization and we are generally more resourceful as individuals and therefore as an organization when we are calm so it's not an acronym but it's an abc assertiveness bravery and calm how about that great uh, <clears throat> I, I think that it, well, the responses are wonderful. Um, what's making me think is that that's not the general perception out there. Um, what's well, not and, calm? Uh, all of those uh, <laughs> oh, in general, okay. like <laughs> yeah, all of all of those. But calm uh, isn't calm isn't newsworthy. I'm not just talking uh, yeah. about the media here. Yeah. In terms of grabbing attention, urgency grabs attention. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like. Um, like, I love what you did there, Jeff, is like, you know, you took the kind of the big picture stuff and like made it a little bit more tangible. Um, and, and, and like this culture of urgency, this culture of escalation, this culture of like, you know, like a lot of times I ask myself first, but then I ask other people, like, what's the actual worst that could happen right now? Like, you know, it, so there's a self check, I think, involved in helping you be calm as a scrum master and like helping you help others, right? Like then how do I leverage facilitation skills, coaching skills, right? To then help others move through whatever we're moving through right now and make intentional choices based on what the reality is versus something that's like, but we have to just get everything done. And that's our reality. It's like, no, that's not the reality. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that, I, that's one of the, what you've what you've said there about what's the worst that can possibly happen that that is probably one of the most common conversations that i have not necessarily in those words but sometimes exactly in those words this just challenging our assumptions about what will happen what can happen what might happen um and we we, we are as human beings we are self-preservationists first and foremost and it's not necessarily about our life or our physical well-being at work usually um it's more around you know, social judgment and ostracism and career progression and looking silly and feeling silly and so on and we will preserve ourselves if we can so thinking these things through and actually what 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 do i and what am i worried that might actually happen here is that logical could i plan against that could i recover against that could i put something in place to help me recover from it and so on um, and and teams need that more than individuals ironically because we have the diffusion of responsibility in a team that somebody else will step up. Um, or, you know, if I put something forward, will the rest of my team come with me and so on. So we, as a, this is where I would come back to that assertiveness as a scrum master, sometimes saying 
it's going to be okay if you take action, if you step up, if you start managing yourselves, is all well and good. But until the, until someone actually sees evidence that somebody goes out of the comfort zone and doesn't get punished, they won't they won't feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, a really good book. Uh, there's always a book, but if you're uncomfortable with this idea of what's the worst that could happen, I think Stephanie's brought up a really good question there. Um, there's a very, very, very old book uh, called Letters uh, from a Stoic by Seneca. And I think it's such an important read if this is an uncomfortable concept for you. So Seneca would actually uh, practice poverty uh, every so often. He would make himself insanely poor and live on the street and realize that this practice was that uh, if he were to lose everything, he would still be here and he would still be alive. And it, and it gave him the freedom to try things. So Letters from a Stoic, it was actually written, I think, in 50 AD. So it's a very, very old book, um, but uh, I think it's excellent. It's just a really wonderful, if that concept is interesting to you, Letters from a Stoic by Seneca is wonderful. Great, thank you. Uh, let's move on to the next question maybe. Uh, we have about half an hour left, so um, I think it's uh, maybe good to, to address a couple more here. One I wanna, uh, from the Liz uh, Padron, Padron, uh, Padron, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, what are your recommendations for non-collocated scrum teams? One of my teams has four different time zones, countries. Pretty common, happens a lot. Um, what are your thoughts and suggestions for Liz and others that have similar situations? I think it's, I find it interesting that in a way that this is is still a question um, <laughs> because it's been a reality for so long. Yeah. And yeah, even, even when I was a scrum master for the first time, we, we, we already had examples of distributed teams being able to work successfully we had many examples of distributed teams not working successfully as well but the you know the common the common things around teamwork don't really change that much just because you're remote the things that make a team successful make a remote team successful there are some harder things some psychological issues come into play um you feel less accountable to one another if you don't see each other uh, you care less about one another in fact you even become suspicious of people you know, the, the longer you don't go uh, seeing them it's harder to build strong relationships and bonds but that's not necessarily essential um, so generally speaking that the tactics that, that have worked for, uh, for throughout my career have been as much as possible try to get together now and again um, just to just to put a face to a name and learn a, bit, a little bit about them as a person listen to uh, listen to each other in terms of your your needs and your desires about working and what do you what do you need from each other from your own perspective in order to be a successful team and are we all willing to commit to that and if not what are we going to do about that it it, it sounds i know it sounds like i'm oversimplifying it but generally speaking, just having those conversations and then inspecting and adapting. Yeah, and um, there's one other thing I'd like to throw out there because it's that I just uh, scheduled a newsletter that's going out tomorrow and this is actually in it. Um, I listened to a podcast recently called The Office is Dying, It's Time to Rethink How We Work. And while it doesn't specifically talk about like time zones, it's talking about this whole idea of like people are not co-located, right? Like different schedules. Um, and so I do think that there's like the questions that, that Jeff is talking about, like we need to have these conversations and think about these things um, and talk about it as a team and kind of come to like, what do we want? What do we need? And, you know, the podcast is long, like it's in depth, it's based on, you know, research from the last two and a half years of this grand experiment, um, but there's a lot of like tangible questions, I think that that can help you have these conversations. And I would also say like how the organization needs to actually set people up for success 
So it's like, yes, there's a team level of this. And yes, there's like a, how is the scrum master helping ensure like the, you know, the team is having these conversations, but there is also things organizations need to do. And I think sometimes it's harder for us to think about how we pose that back to the organization um, and like still keep it self-managing, right? Like let things emerge. Um, let people choose kind of what works for them. So I, I would recommend it. I don't think I actually named it. It's on the Ezra Klein show. I'll send, I'll send you a link to include in the, in the post uh, conference resources, but I, it was really um, interesting and gave me a lot of like new ways to have those conversations and notice impacts that maybe like I, we weren't even really noticing are the impacts of distributed teams um, to, to actually consider. Hey Ryan, I'm gonna I'm gonna break convention and I'm gonna come back in in front of you if that's all right. <laughs> Only because there are a couple of just personal examples for me here. So I don't know when it was ten years ago maybe when when I wrote Scrum Mastery. None of the people involved in that project ever met each other. So my editor uh, was in Colorado, I think. Uh, my graphics designer was in Norway. My reviewers were in different countries. Um, they were they were all over the place. We never met. We didn't need to mate, and we managed to work together. And I think we managed to produce something that worked. So I think if you get good people together who are brought together around something that they all want to be a part of, and their skills and their humanity is respected then I think it works. But I don't think that's anything different to being in the same room. Now, having said that, I'm having a new website built right now. And I one of, one of the reasons I chose the firm to build this website is that they are in the same town as me. So there's no reason for that. You know, I, I could choose anyone in the world because this is digital, even more so now than ever before. Um, but tomorrow they want to go through something on the on the CMS. We want to review the staging website because we're pretty much there. And they sent me a Gmeet link to meet in, in Google. I said, you're down the road, guys. You know, one of the reasons I chose you guys was because I wanted to come and see you. All right. I'd rather spend a couple of hours in your office bashing things through than either asynchronously or over 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 some kind of online tool. So for me, I would always choose, if I had the choice, I would always choose people together, I think. Um, and I rarely use the word always. But I think it's brought home for me this last couple of years just how much of a difference it makes to me to be working with people in the same place. Yeah, I... I... My my thoughts go more towards Jeff's there. If I if I have the choice, I will always choose together. Right, and the word always is dangerous. Uh, there's going to be someone that has an edge case that says that's not a good idea, and 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 I and and so we'll give up the edge cases there. I think Jeff would agree with that. But I think I I'm, I'm with Jeff on the idea of together. I actually again do not have a popular opinion here. I think that people will be back in the office. I think um, the modern day organization is not designed for remote work. And I don't see org charts getting restructured in meaningful ways that allow for remote work to flourish, right? So the, the modern day organization is designed for command and control and looking over your shoulder. We're going to manage you in a certain way. It's not, the org chart is not optimized for delivery and it's not optimized to serve a customer. So in the small instances, like what Jeff is talking about with, building his book. That is amazing, right? When Todd and I built our book, we had uh, Prague Prague had a team that was distributed around the, but it was a handful of people. It was a small team with a, a clear purpose. You know, you know, they, what is it? The, the open minds, clear hearts and a good purpose, and you can do great things, but it's a small team. Now you take a massive team, you take a massive organization. They don't have that. They have an org chart that's built uh, and predicated on physically being together. And that's why we see so much struggle and people having to, you know, we need the right tooling. We need the right mindset. We need a working agreement. No, we need organizational redesign that is not happening today. 
right? So how and much so, do you think it has to, like, you know, this situation, like, you know, was stated at the beginning of this, it's it's been around for, you know, where people are distributed across the globe. And a lot of times it's, you know, uh, people that are hiring, that have the hiring, firing decisions, they're really not good at designing a ecosystem, right? They think you just plug and play. I need some testers. I need them cheap. Let's go to Eastern Europe or India. I need right. this. I need that. And they're not really thinking of what is the long-term cost versus i just need to solve this problem well, that way uh so it is a like it is a structural question but a lot of this is a self-inflicted boom by people that don't know how to put or are not allowed or whatever it is to uh -oh. design environment uh i don't think, I think it's unintentional ask most people <laughs> they'll say either in person or at least if people are uh working remotely have at least like four hours overlap half a day overlap for those people I think we're giving um, too much credit to randomness. I think this is all intentional. I think most modern day companies, not only are the org charts not designed for remote work, they're optimizing very short term profit and benefit. Mm -hmm. it, and and so they will make they will intentionally make these short term decisions and they will they believe they're the correct decisions. And they want to make these decisions for those short term investments. And I'm not saying they're wrong. In some countries, it is illegal to do otherwise. If they are not optimizing shareholder value, there have been court cases, I believe, across the pond that are saying shareholders can sue if you don't optimize for short-term profit. But that's that's the way of, of the world now. Yeah. Um, and so I'm seeing comments about, but that's not system thinking. I, I'm not advocating for any of this. <laughs> yeah. I want organizations to shift and change, to dismantle the org chart, to optimize for delivery. What I'm saying is, we're not seeing that in the marketplace, which is why I think remote work is good for right now because of a pandemic and post-pandemic situation. But people will pull um, their organizations back into the office because they will not make meaningful change. Yeah. Essentially, you're saying, well, <laughs> it's tough to let go of that uh, you know, control. So like, we'll pull back people because of that desire to control, to... to um the, yeah the illusion of control really yeah. right yep. and so, so so ryan talking about like you know actually optimizing for delivery like i just want to name this like he doesn't just mean like efficiency right and getting product out the door like we're talking about how people do their best work together and and i'll just say like i've seen rock star teams that are fully remote and distributed across multiple time zones and i've seen terrible co-located teams, <laughs> like all working together in a room. So, you know, I think there, the, but it, but I think the underlying theme is we do need to think about like, or I should say like, we need to influence and support and organizations in actually creating an environment that enables whatever situation is necessary, enables people to thrive. And the other thing that I initially, like my first response to that question was gonna be a little flippant, then I'll just go ahead and throw it out now, is you know maybe we need to ask ourselves if we should redesign our teams, yeah. right? Like, why are we putting ourselves in a situation if we feel it's difficult to collaborate that way, why don't we assess, should we all, should we think about how we're reorganizing, how we do product delivery? Yeah. Right. So like maybe, that, that's part of self-managing too. Yeah. So maybe like to just uh, say I'm that scrum master or uh, like it's out of my control. What are some practical things that, you know, I could coach, mentor, encourage people if we are stuck in this situation where we have people still distributed across multiple time zones? What are the things that you've seen that actually work in this kind of shitty environment that we're set up for failure in a way? Uh, or not, we're not optimized truly to be a high performing team. What are some of the tips that you would still maybe share, recommend? So if I'm a, a director, a vice president, whoever it is that has teams like this under, under me, right? And this is where I think the authority is going to flow from. Um, I think if I want those teams to be wildly successful, we want a chance at serving people and delivering value to the world and all those great things, I've got to give them full autonomy to work in the best way they deem possible. So if they tell me, Ryan, we need this certain um, uh, code editor because we can pair program online together, 
I'm going to buy that for them. If they say we need uh, whatever tool set, whatever working arrangement, whatever working hours, if they come back and say, it looks weird, but we're going to get an increment every sprint, I've mm -hmm. got to go with it, support it, and, and build that environment. And I think anything short of that is not going to be enough. Uh, and I'll try, like, oh, go ahead. I, I, I was going to try and bring in another question that I saw in the chat and I've tried to hold on to from Roland, which he prefaced with, I don't want to be funny, um, which I think if Ryan was saying, he'd say, this is an unpopular opinion, <laughs> which is that uh, I'll paraphrase you here, Roland, but basically developers aren't necessarily known to be the most um, extroverted. And so it's, is it, is it a challenge? I, I would say this is something that you have to bear in mind, whether it's remote or not, but it's even more amplified when you are remote. So his question is any advice on how to get less extroverted people engaged? And I'll try and bring you back to something that I said earlier on around belief. Now, having the belief in what people are capable of, having the belief about what people um, want, uh, and generally speaking, people want to be successful. But there's also an element of, well, if you're part of an agile team, you can't be an individual completely. So if we assume, I, 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 I've told this story many times before, but I was working in an organization where we were talking about self-organization. One of the managers said, yes, but my problem is, Jeff, people are lazy. All right. And so if you give them an inch, they'll take a mile. And basically, he, he had evidence to back up that view. So no matter how much evidence I had that he, he, I, you know, he was wrong, he knew for a fact he was correct. But he was, because he believed that, he, because of his confirmation bias, he was noticing all the examples that confirmed his view and ignoring all the examples that discredited his view. So this, and if we, I believe that developers or anyone it, it doesn't like or isn't capable of having productive collaboration and conversations with people, then I'll see examples and evidence of, of that. So beware of what your confirmation bias is, is doing for you already and having the belief that people are capable of that if there are, if the conditions are right. You know, I'll be honest. I miss the office. So Todd right. and I, I know not everybody does, right? I know not so everybody does. Todd and I talked about this uh, just the other day. There are co-working um, so Todd's in Pennsylvania. I'm in Indiana. We're not going to get together very often, uh, but when we do, it's it's fun. But we're actually talking about renting um, space at, at local co-working offices just to be around people. Um, it's really weird. Like we actually had that conversation, and and so I know not everybody does. I think I also love working at home because I sleep in my bed every night. I see my family. I see my wife and kids. I really like those people. There are also like times when you can when you can shut off and Todd can't yeah. get hold of you, right? Right. You, absolutely. And you could, and so we perhaps as as one type of person have had the had the luxury of being able to go to places where there are people. Yeah. yeah. And you know, one of the things that I felt sorry for certain members of the agile team is that they haven't had this, the time and space to be quiet and share everything off and say just just go away yeah we need to focus and agile teams have always been about having a balance of quiet time and noisy time oh yeah and now now we've gone from a, a, an over burden of noisy time to an overburden of quiet time and there's got to be something in the middle well it's interesting that you bring that up because i think one of the things that's happening is we're trying to solve the problem with technology and somebody is like, okay, here's these new communication channels. And what's happening is it's actually making it more like people are basically like performing. They're being performative to make it look like they're working, right? Like I need, like I, like I can't just walk away from Slack or Teams or whatever it might be, right? Because if somebody, if I don't respond right away, people are going to think I'm not really working, right? And it's like, there's a level of like extra, like, I don't know, like spinning on a hamster wheel that I think some teams are doing in this environment because they feel like they have to. But that's part always of been there though. Like, you know, I, I think even before COVID, like, you know, where people would, you know, one person would work from home or they would be in another building. Yeah. Uh, and I think it is, it is part of that, 
part of that kind of figuring out this next phase. And I think it'll be a combination. I think, you know, it, it's definitely what you said, I think earlier, it really comes back to the psychology, understanding humans and like how we communicate and collaborate. And if you look at you know, that, uh, we're social people, we, we communicate, we build trust easier, try to build trust with the teammate on Zoom that you've never seen versus somebody that, you know, you've actually worked with. I tell people like, you know, some of the best retrospectives that I've facilitated happen at the bar. Like, you know, like it's it's getting to know people. Uh, maybe we have a chance for one more uh, question, but Tim, maybe I'll give you another chance just to uh, uh, add comment or ask a quick question and then we'll move on, move on maybe to our last question. Yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't know if this is really an easy one because we're, we're talking around things. We're talking, you know, great points from the panel, but really what we're faced with is there's an inertia in the industry that doesn't want to do agile or doesn't understand agile forget you know all the frameworks it's you we've got to overcome the inertia of the mindset how do we do that how can we effectively do that i mean i'm 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 mr evangelist agile evangelist in my company all the time and it's like sometimes i don't see the ball being moved down the field i don't think anybody's against winning and so let's just drop the jargon and the lingo and let's talk about behaviors. Now, I think that's one of the reasons why I love Jeff's book. Um, Scrum Mastery is about behavior. I mean, it, it's, it, it just beautifully describes the behaviors that you see for, for great Scrum Masters. And I think we need to um, embrace that and just say, hey, we're going we're gonna to build some stuff for a while after we build this kind of plan for what we're going to do for a few weeks. And then we're going to show it to people and we're going to build some alignment there and make sure that we're meeting their needs. And we're going to repeat that for a little bit. And we're also going to check in with each other to make sure we're working in a way that we all love and there's joy and there's success. And we're going to repeat that for a little while and try to make sure that we're serving. And, and by the way, you know, Miss CEO, we're going to protect your investment. We got this person here watching the budget and, and, and maximizing value. Does any of that sound bad? No. They want that. They want the stewardship of funds. They want the, the delivery when we win. They want All those things are great. But then the jargon comes in and there's baggage assigned to every word now. Agile has baggage. Scrum has a ton of baggage. No one knows what the heck a Scrum Master is at the C-level. Product owner, wait, isn't that product manager? Well, I don't know. Uh, what the heck's a daily Scrum and why can't I attend it? it? The list goes on and on. So get just drop it. Talk about behavior. And then go do it. It's and like then behavior do it again. and benefits, right? So it's like, and know who your audience is. So like to your point, if you're talking to C level, like what do they care about? Their investments, right? So talking about like, well, you know, we're trying to kind of take this approach because we know that our market change is really fast. Remember that time we got really burned by putting all of this money into something and we didn't validate our assumption, right? Like so leverage storytelling real world experiences that people can relate to to say here's why we want to work in a different way or here's what we're going to try because we're trying to avoid this risk happening again or because hey we're noticing our markets changing really fast and we're falling behind right so like we're leveraging practices that help us really hone in on value and understanding our customers better right so those are just a few more ideas to think about like how you your language and what you talk about like affects right the perception and like it doesn't lead people into that like oh like oh yeah. you, you said a word that i have a lot of baggage around or that holds baggage in our organization yeah yeah that reminded me also like it's not just behaviors like i i recently read michael spades i put the link in the chat uh agile transformation book which where he looks at behavior systems like organizational structures culture and mindset and you know, in a way, it's an integral approach to uh, to change, right? So it, it, there's there's a lot more at play than just behaviors, but behaviors are one of the key things that we're actually ultimately changing. But you change behavior by changing environment. You change behavior by changing the culture. You change the behavior by change the mindset. Um, so maybe that's another uh, resource that you guys can check out. Uh, last question. Uh, how can agile teams effectively manage dependencies? This is one of the questions at least I get asked a lot. So maybe we can finish with this one. What are your thoughts, comments? Uh, what could you share on how people can manage dependencies better? Stop managing them. <laughs> Eliminate them. Seriously. 
if your architecture is bad, fix your architecture. If you do not have nine times out of 10, you do, you do not have a truly cross-functional team, which is why you have dependencies, right? So fix your org chart, fix your architecture. I would rather people invest in, put, put the millions of dollars there before you buy an agile transformation. And I'm using air quotes because I think those are nonsense, um, but, but the term is understood, right? And so fix those things so that you don't have to manage dependencies. They just go away. Uh, Kanban guys would say, though, well, if you ask David uh, Anderson, they would say, you know, uh, you, you, you can't get rid of dependencies. I don't know who that is. Um, I'm a big Dan, Dan Vicanti though would say, listen to Ryan. So I'm, <laughs> I, so I'm, uh, I'm a big fan of Vicanti and I, I work, we talk with him quite a bit. He's a, he's very scrum adjacent. He's a very, he's a, he's an ally with us. And uh, uh, I trust his Kanban techniques. And uh, I think he would agree that the more you can eliminate dependencies rather than manage them, yeah. uh, the better off your team will be. Yeah, no, I think, uh, yeah, minimizing dependencies there, in my opinion, there's yeah. always dependencies. So in a complex yeah. environment, you have dependencies, but minimize, we, there are a lot of dependencies that are uh, uh, created unnecessarily. Uh, Stephanie or Jeff? Yeah, I was just going to add to that, like the, the mic drop answer, same as what Ryan said, right? Like, yeah. don't just manage them. Don't just assume you have to live with them. Right. Like do what you can to eliminate and or minimize the impact. This doesn't have to be like a big bang solution to every dependency you have. Right. So make the, the dependency transparent, both in terms of things like, um, you know, the, the cost of it. Right. Maybe there's a cost of delay to get something to a customer. Maybe it's the cost of rework. Um, right. Like maybe there's an actual, you know, like tangible dollar impact you can create from that. Right. So what's the impact of living with this dependency? How frequently does this dependency affect us? And that could be like a 10 X multiplier, right. When you actually, so it's like about transparency really. Right. So I always say like scrum masters, number one tool is transparency. How do I make, create more transparency to what's really happening and create a compelling case and get the people involved, right? Have the right conversations with the right people and you need transparency to the data, the impacts of that. And then again, like not looking for the big bang solution. It's like, what is a thing we can do to move in the right direction here? And if people are afraid, right? It's an experiment. <laughs> Like it's not permanent. We're, we're just running an experiment, um, you know? So there's lots of ways to get some forward momentum there, but I think it does start with making the impacts of it transparent. I don't have anything else to add on dependencies. So what I would like to do instead is I would like to answer Tim's question from before. And I can completely feel the emotion in the question, the frustration, um, and that that frustration is a real thing. And this, this, well, when I said about my ABC, this is what I've had to work on because I'm an incredibly impatient person. <laughs> Unfortunately, we are in a very slow moving, in one way, world. Even though the world is moving very, very fast, change still takes time. And it's a, it, there's an analogy of boiling a frog that if you throw a, a frog into a pan of boiling water, it will jump out straight away. But if you put a frog in a pan of room temperature water and boil it slowly, it will just sit there and die because it doesn't notice the small changes. And we don't notice the small changes that we're seeing on a regular basis because we're in the middle of it. But if you look back 10 years, 20 years, we have come a long way. It doesn't feel like it right now, but we have. We have planted a lot of seeds and Craig Lama once said, you know, there was a point in time when people knew for a fact, doctors knew for a fact that the way to cure illness was leeches. They knew it. It was a fact. And even with the advent of penicillin and drugs and all that kind of stuff, those, those doctors held on to their beliefs. It took that whole generation of doctors to die out before the new truth was universally accepted. And I'm not saying we need to wait for these people to die off, but what I'm seeing is I'm seeing a shift in demographics at the senior level. But those senior people, and this is where I go back to my second, my B, my belief, my belief in them as people, that even though it's really hard, 
to think that they're doing anything, that they're doing anything positive, that they have good intentions. There's a very good chance they are party to conversations that we are not. There's a good chance that they're signed up to NDAs that we are not privy to, that they have conflicts and tensions and political agreements that they have to abide by, even if they didn't want to, and they can't talk about it. So we have to assume that they have good things, but there are incentives for short-term share options, for example, that a lot of these people's bonuses are, are based on, um, and the next promotion. So being understanding of the uh, empathizing with the situation these people are in, they may see the logic in what you're saying, but there are incentives that are naturally conflicting with what they would like to do. But the other thing that these people, these senior people have to contend with, and a lot of them aren't conscious of it, is what's got them to where they are isn't necessarily what they need to get them somewhere else. And that's scary because they are highly visible people in an organization and they're faced with the prospect of what they need to do now isn't what they have been doing. They need different skills and they don't know how to add value anymore if they're not there making decisions and telling people what to do. It's a very scary place for them and they're not used to being vulnerable. So empathize with those people. Um, I know you use the word evangelist and I know you don't mean it like an evangelist, but think about the messages that we're putting out there. Are we at some level trying to convince other people that we have a better answer? Because if we are, even implicitly, we're making it harder for ourselves because those people then have to admit that we were right and they were wrong. They have to climb down from their previously held view of the world and take on somebody else's. And nobody likes to do that, let alone someone in seniority. So as Ryan said, talk about behaviors, talk about benefits, tie it into their objectives, their motivations, their goals, their drivers, make it their idea, not the process, but the outcome. And then we've got a chance. Great. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Great suggestion. And I think it, it, it's, again, that shift maybe that, that, that we're looking for, maybe, you know, you call it a shift, maybe it's a paradigm shift, but it takes time. And, you know, I've talked to a lot of thought leaders and they said, we made a lot of progress in the last 20 years. We want it overnight, but, you know, agile is still young or this movement is still young. Um, what would you like to share as final thoughts uh, with 400 or so people here? Maybe just keep it short, but Your final, final. Go easy part. on yourself. <laughs> Go easy on yourself. Go easy on each other, but keep pushing yourself and keep pushing each other. Yeah, I, I, I echo that. You know, this is something that um, Todd and I, and I know Jeff and Stephanie. I think they're a little younger than me, but maybe not. Um, we've been thinking about this stuff for the past 20, 25 years, and we still mess it up. Like I still mess up as a scrum master. I still don't know everything. I still, um, I mean, I wrote a book called Fixing Your Scrum and I'm not sure how to fix everyone's practices, <laughs> right? I don't know how to do all of that. Um, but I, I, we try and we try things and I fail constantly and we try something else and maybe it works a little better. And anyone promising the, the right true way, the one true way, walk away quickly um, or run. But just, yeah, I like that, Jeff. Take it easy on yourself. We're all still learning. We're all still trying things. And the fact that you're willing to try something after one thing didn't work is awesome. Uh, failure to adapt is, I think, the number one killer of organizations and teams. So keep trying things, keep changing. Uh, you know, to Jeff's point, you know, make it about outcomes and how these things help other people. And you might have a chance of, of getting these things to work. So. Yeah, I like that. It's a good, that's a good key thought there, Jeff. Yeah. And just to kind of remind us, right? Like we're in this really weird role where we are accountable, right? Like we are, our success is measured by the growth and success of others and outcomes that are literally beyond our control. Like, I mean, for re like really think about what that means. And so to me, like everything we're talking about here is like, let go of control. And I have layers and layers and layers of control. Like I strip one thing away and then I'm like, oh, there's me trying to control things and think I know the answer and, you know, feel compelled to have a perfect plan and get it right. And so again, this is why it's like this kind of constant, like 
how am I showing up right now? Where am I still kind of even myself bringing in like these mindsets that are no longer serving me and the team and the organization? So it's like, we are a constant growth work in progress as well. And so give your, like, don't take yourself too seriously. This is really hard. Um, and just, you know, it's, it's about recovery. It's all about recovery, notice and recover.